Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek. And as promised, we will talk about dinosaurs today. Dinosaurs and the deification of the dead. And I hope we will get to Abraham as well. But let's start with dinosaurs. Well, first of all, dinosaurs are were and are real. The word dinosaur simply means a uh, terrible lizard. It was coined in the uh, mid-ish 1800s for things that people had in the past had a name for. People before that called them dragons. <laughs> but with the coming of Darwin and with um, Lyle's introduction of um, the slow progression of all things uniformitarianism, we, we, they wanted to separate those concepts from their new way of looking at things. And so if there were these monstrous things that people were discovering as fossils, the, they, they must be very ancient. And of course, dragons, that's not scientific. And, <laughs> and so they just kind of kicked dragons out the door, introduced dinosaurs and said that, but they were millions of years ago and no man ever saw a live one. Children continue to play games with them anyway, but you know. <laughs> I, <clears throat> wonder, I don't want to place too much weight on this, uh, but it seems like some sort of social concept of wonder might have been kicked out the door <laughs> with the <laughs> kicking out of the dragons in uh, favor of yeah. the more scientific. I think you're right, dinosaur. Because when God wants to inspire Job with awe toward the end of his book, he points to two seemingly fabulous creatures, but they were real because all the other animals God describes are real. God is taking him on a walk through the zoo and saying, how about this animal? How about that animal? How about this bird? How about this? And, and then finally in chapter 40, God says this, Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency, and array thyself with glory and beauty. Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath, and behold everyone that is proud, and abase him. Look on everyone that's proud, and bring him low, and tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together, and bind their faces in secret. Then will I also confess unto thee that thine own right hand can save thee. Behold now behemoth, mm -hmm. which I made with thee. That is, God made man and all the land animals on the sixth day of creation. So these are not prehistoric creatures. They, they are within the memory of men who wrote history, and particularly within the memory of Adam, who first saw them. And the word behemoth is a modified form of behemoth, which is cattle, big cattle, really big cattle, <laughs> impressive cattle. He eateth grass as an ox. He's a vegetarian. Lo, now his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar, N not like little branches hanging, hanging down and dangling, but like the tree. He's got this really huge tail, like a tree. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword approach to him. Surely the mountains bring him forth food where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadow, and the willows of the brook compass him about. He lives in marshes, uh, swamps. Behold, he drinketh up a river. He's got a big belly and can drink a lot of water. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. He taketh it with eyes, his nose pierceth through snares. He apparently has a rather long nose. Now, if you talk to any average eight-year-old who probably has read books on dinosaurs or has little plastic dinosaurs he plays with, and you say, lives in the marshes, really long tail, long neck, and big body, and ribs like iron, the kid will probably tell you exactly what this is. The generic name is Sauropod. Um, when I was young, this was there were a few versions. Uh, Brontosaurus was one that since, since has been revised, but since maybe has been re-revised <laughs> because it was the, the original that was called the Brontosaurus was 
uh, the scout, the body of one creature and the head of another. They got mixed up. Hmm. But apparently, I, I think Brontosaurus has been reassigned. Uh, Apatosaurus was the new name for a while. But there's also, there's also the Brachiosaurus and Plotticus and other things. These are the things you usually see in movies or in the Flintstones. You remember, <laughs> um, what was his name? Dino? Dino. Dino. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was a sauropod. Just a um, little one. But he was a little one, yes. And the construction working dinosaurs, um, they were at the beginning of the Flintstones opening. That those those animals are kids yeah, know my adults generation, sometimes don't. It's the it's the long necks from Land Before Time. Oh yes, that too. Mm -hmm. There you go. So there's one thing that God says, be impressed. These things are cool. But God's not done yet because then he points to another creature. Apparently not a land animal, because we'll see at the end, he, he looks like he swims in the ocean. He's called Leviathan. Can thou draw out Leviathan with a hook, or his tongue with a cord, which thou let us down? Can thou put a hook into his nose, or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make supplication unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Will thou take him for a servant forever? Wilt thou play with him as with a bird, or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him amongst the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons, or his head with fierce spears? Now, I need to stop here for a second, because the most common uh, interpretation given by orthodox conservative commentaries is that this is a crocodile which would kind of make most of these rhetorical questions not so rhetorical, because the answer to almost all of them would be, well, yeah, yeah. crocodiles aren't all that, unless it's a really, really big crocodile. We know about the crocodile hunter. Yeah, we don't. It, we know it about sounds him. more like some of the great sea creatures that we see in novels when a lot of the sailing ships start going out. Yeah. And there's these creatures that come and somehow break up an entire ship, and they don't know what it is. That. That's what it reminds me of more that's, than yeah, that's, a crocodile. <laughs> that's more of what we're dealing with here. Uh, skipping down a couple verses. Uh, Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce to dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me, says God? And that's the point. These animals are really cool and impressive and awesome. God is far more awesome, far more terrible far more the one we should stand in awe of. But he goes back to the creature. Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a close seal. One is so near another that no air can come between them. They're joined one to another. They stick together. They cannot be sundered. By his sneezings, a light does shine. And his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. And people are quick to say, well, that's metaphor. It's poetic. Okay, well, just hang with us for a minute. Verse 19, out of his mouth goeth burning lamps. Um, Lamp and being a metaphor for, <laughs> for fire. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> sparks that of, up. <laughs> yeah, and sparks of fire leap out. Okay, this is obviously poetic language, and yet it's like poetry doesn't mean you can't understand it or it doesn't make mm -hmm. any sense. It just means it's somewhat colorful and drawing our attention to what things are like. This thing, this animal, um, it, its breath, its sneezing, uh, what comes out of its throat is compared to light and fire and lamps. And then out of his nostrils go a smoke as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath, okay, it's, well, maybe it's phosphorescent. He's just swallowed in a lot of stuff and he breathes it out and the air kind of glows. Well, that might work to this point, but then there's this. His breath kindleth coals <laughs> and a flame go out of it out of his mouth that's not now later on the beast is going to be described as trailing phosphorescence but that's not this this is something that sets things on fire in his neck remain a strength he, he's got a neck by the way as opposed to a crocodile doesn't have much of one <laughs> and sorrow is turned into joy before him the flakes of his flesh are joined together they are firm in themselves, they cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone, yea, as hard as a piece of nether millstone. When he raiseth up himself, okay, imagine a crocodile trying to get up on his hind legs. <laughs> um, and, and, and still being tall enough to look down on people when he has. When he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of the breakings, they purify themselves. 
The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold the spear, the dart, nor the habergeon. He esteemeth iron as straw. He can break iron. And brass is rotten wood. He, this this thing can smash through metals. Your your um, comparison, uh, Rachel, to these sea monsters we see in movies and books and such that actually can smash through ships. Yeah, apparently they can. Um, the arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spread the sharp pointed things upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. The deep is the ocean. And when he's thrashing around it, it or beneath the surface, it looks like the whole thing's boiling. So this is a big creature. This is not a small thing. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Now that's probably phosphorescence. And there are animals that trail such things, and even ships do under certain circumstances. Upon the earth there is not his like who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things. He is king over all the children of pride. And, and so when God wants to impress Job, there's so many things he could point to. He could point to angels and cherubim. He just picks out two monstrous creatures that sound an awful, well, the first one sounds an awful lot like a dinosaur. The second one sounds an awful lot like a fire-breathing dragon <laughs> and says, you were saying, <laughs> <laughs> you think you're hot stuff, hot stuff, Job? Look at these creatures. Can you Can you make them or stand up to them or do anything? No, really not? Then... Why are you telling me what to do, and why are you judging me? You're, you're in no position to do anything. These animals later become symbols that God will use, symbolically, figuratively. We'll run into Leviathan in the Psalms and in Isaiah and in the book of Revelation. There's a monster from the land and one from the ocean. So we're being set up. And, and yet here, in this context, although the language is poetic, these are real things. Later on in Isaiah's prophecy, we hear that the land of Arabia contained fiery flying serpents. And interestingly enough, the Greek writer Herodotus also mentions flying serpents as a feature of the Arabian world and how the ibises, the tall stork like traffic birds, would go after them. Um, the ancient world knew about these things. Talked about them when there was some point, but mostly it was just kind of, yeah, they're out there. Um, God, uh, in Noah's time, did put the fear of man upon all creatures, which is to say that we should not expect dragons to rise out of Tokyo Bay and try to destroy the city. <laughs> but get find one someplace in some obscure place and corner him, and you might have a fight on your hands. So they were there. And as men wandered through the wildernesses, they could hear dragons in the distance. And, and again, Isaiah and some of the other prophets in recording the collapse and fall of great empires says, and the ruins will be a habitation of dragons. So these things were out there. There weren't as many as there had once been. Maybe the climate changes and that followed the ice ages was unfriendly to them. We don't need a meteor strike or an asteroid strike to account for their disappearance. And very late on, we still see these things. And you know, when you look around, on Nature Channel or something, you will see, and we, we've been dissing crocodiles, but really great big crocodiles and alligators and Komodo dragons, if we didn't see them today and we found their skeletons, we would say, oh, more dinosaurs. Because that's kind of what dinosaurs are like. Lizards are born usually pretty small and they grow all their life. Let them grow a long time and they get really big. Um, so there's nothing unscientific here. How do how do dragons breathe fire? I have no idea. I'm not a biologist, but apparently even God biologists this don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, yeah. <laughs> there's an awful lot biologists don't know. Um, but you it know, seems human... that a lot of these things became fantasy as our more modern scientific movement rose, mm. because these are meant to challenge our sense of control of the world. Mm. Mm -hmm. you, because he's pointing them to to Job and saying. Can you even figure these things out, let alone me? Yeah. Um, can you control these? You cannot control your environment, your world. Um, but it seems our stories of the last 200 years all purposefully 
even land before time is telling us, oh, they're way far away. They have, they can't do anything to humans. They're probably not real. Or if they are, we're not meant to interact with them. And so it, it changes our perspective on history when we assume nothing like this would exist in our Mm -hmm. time. We kind of simplify things and make them more manageable. So you're telling me it's not a coincidence that we've eliminated wonder along with the dragons. (laughs) Yes. No, yeah, that's not, <laughs> exactly. not no, no coincidences. Yeah, modern science doesn't really like wonder. They they tend to want everything in a a lab or a test tube. Put it in a box, lock the box. <laughs> well, and what goes with that is the glorification of man. Mm-hmm. These these dragons, these dinosaurs were not all that, but man on the other hand. One of the common themes that runs throughout the ancient world from Mesopotamia to Greece and Roman Egypt to Scandinavia to Mexico, the Aztec Empire, and the Polynesian Islands and beyond, is the idea that man can eventually become God. And then while there are entire systems built around this, in particular, particularly later on we have Caesar worship and the worship of Pharaoh's son of the divine son, from a very early point, well, from the beginning, mm-hmm. Satan had said, you can be as gods deciding good and evil for yourself. And as men looked at themselves, they saw themselves die, which, you know, doesn't look so much like we're God. <laughs> and unless when we unless die. That's the pathway to deification. That's the pathway to deification. Yeah. Uh, we know that the ancient ancients did deify their dead rulers. Uh, we are told of in um, Genesis 10, just in passing, describing Ham's line, Cush, son of Ham, begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. <laughs> in the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar, round about Babylon. Out of that land went forth Asher. The margin says he went into Assyria, and Assyria is called the land of Nimrod and the prophets, um, and builded Nineveh, the city of Rehoboth and Kalna, and reason between Nineveh and Kala, the same as a great city. Moses, or whoever wrote the original section here, knew that Nimrod was this great anti- or post-Diluvian ruler. He was associated with Babel. When we hear about Babel, it sounds more democratic. Let us do this, let us do that. But even democratic uprisings have charismatic leaders. <laughs> uh, his father, Cush, seems to have been the original for Hermes and Mercury, the god of language, in this case, the one who confounded languages with his sin. He's called Bel amongst the Babylonians. In fact, there are two Bells. There's Bel and his son, Bel. <laughs> um which means Lord, because there was the first Lord, Cush, and then there was another Lord, Nimrod. But eventually, someplace, somehow, Nimrod died. And suddenly, in the wake of that, we begin to get gods, humanoid gods, gods who seem to have been humans. Um, the same thing happens in the line of Shem. The father of the Assyrians is named Asher, and oddly enough, their chief god is named Asher. Asher. <laughs> so men began to deify their ancestors and their great rulers. Nimrod seems to have been one of those at least who set the tone. Uh, ancient traditions assigned to him a wife named Semiramis. Uh, so Nimrod may be the, the male god, Baal and Bel and all of that. And Semiramis, the female god, Ishtar and Astarte and Ashtaroth. Um, certainly the theme of a male dimension of nature and a female dimension of nature permeates the ancient world. And yet as as late or as early, depending on how you look at it, as Cicero, Cicero is pointing out in his discussions that your gods are all men. They're deified men. We can, you've been initiated in the mysteries. You know the stories. You know how this happened. You, we can point out their tombs. We know where where Zeus was born and where Zeus was buried. And so with the other gods. And when Christian apologists came along, they just picked it up and said, yeah, right. And oddly enough, the pagans never said, you're making that up. These gods have been here forever. They just kind of quietly. Mm-hmm. Um, because It's more is- like we never said they were really real. <laughs> uh, it, 
because very early on, and, and it's a little clearer, well, we, we, we see this in Egypt, and I've mentioned in another context Agatha Christie's story, um, Death Comes as an End, which is set in ancient Egypt. Her husband was an archaeologist. And they had archaeological friends who, de who dealt in Egypt. So she did a good job of, of representing this. The idea that when your ancestor dies, you bury him probably on your property line someplace, and then you feed him, you feed his spirit to keep him happy, and he will bless you. Because if you don't, he may get ticked off, and his spirit may come back. As And here we have the idea of ghosts. And may torment you and bring you disease and all kinds of horrible things on you. And the same was true in the Greek Isles and amongst the Romans. Uh, there were spirits of the dead, and they had to be kept happy. And so their tombs, originally there was no idea of a collective Hades. That came later in, in Greek mythology. Originally, grandpa, dead grandpa was the living God, and he was out and back in a tomb, you know, six feet under. That's where he was, and that's where you brought food and water and flowers and such. And um, we still see that the, the Disney film Coco uh, approaches this in its discussion of the Day of the Dead. And Rachel, you've done some research here. Yes. So um, I have the background of teaching it some to my Spanish students, but I've also looked into it a little bit more. Uh, so it the Day of the Dead or Dia de los Muertos is something primarily we see in Mexico, but it does have different aspects that show up in other parts of um, Central and South America. And it's an interesting celebration because it takes a mix of Catholic All Souls Day and mixes it with Aztec and other types of traditions. So you take the two things that should not go together and you mix them <laughs> and you get what they celebrate there. So in the Dia de los Muertos, it does come right after what we would think of as Halloween and All Saints Day in November and kind of corresponds with that tendency we see in cultures to, to remember the day when lots of people died. Um, yeah. That. We, yeah, we could go back to the flood for that. But in this, they are drawing on the Aztec view of um, wanting to kind of mock at death and make it a celebration instead of something bad. And mm -hmm. so we have the people wearing the skulls are the painted skulls that are smiling because they're smiling at death to say death isn't bad. And they're making food for their ancestors because they believed the Aztecs did it for a whole month. But um, the modern version is for a day where they believe that the barrier between the worlds, the spirit and the, uh, the living world goes down. And so they can cross over. And so you have to greet them with food and presents and, um, and all of that, at least originally, was because they believed they could actually commune with those those uh, ancestors and receive guidance for this life from those that have passed on because they would know more and be able to, in a sense, guide the family on their way. Uh, so you see their version of an offering or an altar where they remember and offer those the gifts to the spirits um, in this attempt to basically treat death like it's not bad. It's more of the the entrance into the next level where you can gain more knowledge. And the Aztec version actually had many different levels that you would ascend through in the spirit world towards your final, your final end. But in the midst of that, they would come back and visit for time. So mm -hmm. it's the um, Western Hemisphere version of um, of trying to stay connected with your ancestors that have died and to show that death is not really the end, but that you can cross over or reach through that veil that the Bible very clearly tells us not to reach through and uh, continue and to have fellowship with. So it's definitely portraying death as an ascension of sorts. Yes. Yes. Okay. And yeah, those who have died have more to offer to us than the living do in a mm. sense. Uh, God through Isaiah does a little jab at that. Um, should the living seek to the dead? 
Um, mm. Don't listen to the to the spirits that peep and that mutter. Mm. <laughs> Should not a people turn to their God from the living to the dead to the law of the testimony? If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. So Isaiah mocks the whole concept. You you think dead people know more than you do? What? <laughs> They're dead. <laughs> How did that make them omniscient? Well, because we believed the human race believed that somehow death was at least for some persons particularly if you were the father of a large tribe or clan or you were the the emperor of a great kingdom then that could happen um in egypt the pharaohs of course the sons of the divine son made a big deal over their deity and yet and we'll talk about egypt uh, before too long every common Egyptian had hopes of preserving his body in such a way that when his ka, his soul self passed into the next world, could stand before the gods in judgment and sneak by them and go on and become his own little Osiris, his own little god. So although they were sure that the emperors, the pharaohs did this, they all hoped they could too. Mm -hmm. um, the, and this the is the hope of Mormonism as well today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, there yes. you go. This, yes. this is... The common yeah. theology of the of, of the pagan world. We will be as gods. And and so when archaeologists and sociologists go back, anthropologists, and look at the ancient world, most of them are thoroughgoing secularists who really don't understand religion at all. <laughs> they they know a little bit about ritual magic and they know a little bit about idol worship and the the outward forms and a little about the mythology, but they don't get that people actually believe this stuff. And that they erected entire cultures and, and, and circled their entire personal lives around their commitment to these beliefs. And, and so archaeologists and anthropologists can discover little facts that are, are helpful to us. And we can read their works and say, oh, well, that's interesting. They did that. But as Christians, we have a much clearer idea of why they did these things. They wanted to be God. They wanted to make rules for themselves. They wanted to escape judgment. They wanted to transcend time. And... Um, they they calmed themselves into thinking that somehow this was possible. So as we're again, we're looking at history. These are not little tribal superstitions in the dark corners of the earth. This was the classical world. And and one of the reasons I shiver, tremble, and my blood boils a little bit when Christians stand up and say, classical culture, what a great model for education. <laughs> Do you even mm -hmm. begin to understand what you're talking? You're not what's, what's going on here. Is you're not taking these people seriously. They've told us what they believe. We have enough of their writings to understand what they believe, what they were committed to from the the early uh, Catholic religions that worship God in the ground in the backyard to worshiping the spirits that had transcended all that and reached Olympus to beyond that the ideals of of Plato or the One of Parmenides. They're very clear, and all, and, and the secularists don't get it either. The, the Greek philosophers became purely naturalistic and no longer confined to religious interpretations. They are thoroughly religious, and if you would read what they actually say, there's no doubt they knew they were talking religion. It's just that they got tired of religion that even they thought was stupid. <laughs> yeah. Okay, e. this is Hart a dumb has myth. written a, a whole book arguing that it's only through the spread of Christianity through the Western world, that the idea of a secular aspect to life has even been yeah. developed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you know the title? A Secular Faith by D.G. Hart. Okay. Yeah, and that, that is so absolutely true. It took Christianity to de deify the world. And then, of course, they accept, well, if the world isn't God, then what do we need God for? Let's just kind of push him aside and revel in this world that's it's not divine, so obviously God's not there. How about God's sovereignty, providence, imminent? Yeah, no. Uh, no, 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 no. We got, we, got, we got God out of this. And yes, the world is secular and a little bit boring, and you can get words worth complaining that you go out and you look, and you no longer see Triton rising from the sea or nymphs and dryads out in the forest and the lakes, and feel sad about it because we've de we've de deified reality. And I don't remember if it was Chesterton or Lewis who said... Um, yeah, and if he ever really saw Triton rising from the <laughs> sea, he would run away screaming, these are demons. And uh, yeah, so that's what was, as we look at the ancient world, uh, these were not, you know, we, we think of um, of some of our Catholic friends as being Christmas Easter Catholics. 
Mm. Meaning mm-hmm. they, they give a little bit of lift service and they do the religious thing at certain times of the years, but it doesn't really affect them. And we, we try to impose that back on the pagan world. That's not it. These people really believe in me. Speaking of books to read, here's another one. Um, C.S. Lewis's Till We Have Faces, mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. he portrays very clearly what the old pagan religions were like and how they emotionally gripped and terrified uh, their worshipers, and then contrast it with the new intellectualized faith that came from the Greek philosophers and that brought the Olympian gods down to manageable uh, forms. And he can show us, well, well, this this approach had this advantage and this approach had this advantage, but you know what? People really believe these, and, and, and people didn't suddenly give up their old gods simply because Plato or Aristotle said something about man having a soul. They just simply think, Man's a god now because soul, fine. <laughs> um, so as we as we study history, we're going to we need to keep bringing this up and saying, this is how they thought, this is how they acted, this is what they believed, and it is everywhere. And and back to, um, uh, sorry, the book you've, you've been recommended. Did is it digital liturgies or yeah, digital oh, liturgies, digital yes, yeah. The 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 little intro about fish and water. Mm-hmm. Which I've which I've seen in other contexts, but you know the old fish looks as a new fish. How's the water? What's water? Uh, we look at the pagan world, and, and we're tempted to say, "Where's the religion? Where isn't the religion?" Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, the um, the book, the ancient city, uh, takes this very seriously. So I recommend that as well. Mm-hmm. And I well, think in, in all of this, one of the things we should keep in mind from where we started is that these are all manifestations of their rejection of the curse that God gave mm. it, and of, of trying to grasp on to the truth that Satan gave of saying, no, God, that's not actually what's going to happen. And Satan, yes, we believe you, um, that we can be as gods, that we do not need to be simple dependent creatures who die. We can live on and become gods, we can get that great name for ourselves, Mm -hmm. which is what they're over and over again, the whole make a name for ourselves, have a great name, be a great Mm -hmm. uh, man before, you know, a mighty hunter before the Lord, that over and over again, they're trying to deny what God has said would be real Mm -hmm. and believe Satan. Um, They're trying to take the sting out of death in their own way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the more, and each culture finds its own way to make death palatable because everybody has to face it. And so in our day, we have our own way of claiming we'll find dignity in death. For them, it was, you'll find Godhead or Godhood in death um, that we we do need to take seriously because we do it too, just in a different way. Mm-hmm. Well, with that said as a foundation, let's just glance back and see what we have. We have men divided by language and family groups spreading out across the planet. We have sheets of ice descending from the Norse while the Earth's climate rebalances itself. Out in the wasteland, we have dragons, dinosaurs, monsters that may not come after us, but if we go after them, they're scary. Uh, And we have men building communities and the leaders of these communities claiming for themselves or their ancestors later claiming for them that they are sons of God, that they're divine. And with the spread of humanity, things like trade arise. We, we, we have lumber, they have sand, you could make glass out of that. And all those people over there, they have cows. Oh, and these people have goats and these people have wheat. Huh, funny that we don't all have all of it. <laughs> and we can either go conquer them all, and sometimes that was a solution, or maybe we can start trading. You just got to get got to get around this language problem. And oddly enough, they did because people who want to make money learn really fast how to point at things and hold up fingers. <laughs> it's not that hard to communicate. If both sides really want something, they'll figure out a way to work out the language barrier, and eventually, we'll actually go to the trouble of learning the other's language or something close enough to it that they can they can do business. Um, This is the ancient world. And from Noah to Abraham are 10 generations. Uh, And during that time, cities are rising and falling. 
Uh, the climate change is having its effect as the ice approaches. Some men forge forward into it and make their their homes in caves. Others retreat from it toward warmer climates. Uh, people run out of land and jump on boats and sail they know not where. So little by little, the command that God gave to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth is being carried out, not particularly willingly, but either in search of new treasures, new resources, or in fear of people are trying to take your stuff. And all the while, watch out for the dragons. <laughs> um, and, and so we come in Scripture, this, all of this that we've talked about goes from chapter 10 and chapter 11. And then we hit the tail end of 11 and 12, and we meet this man, Abram. For whom we have about five minutes, by the way. Oh, well, you always hope that you're going to have more time than you do. So next time, <laughs> we're going to be talking about what God does with him, because his story and the story of his sons and then of, of their sons makes up the rest of the book of Genesis. We've gone 12 chapters. There's 50 some chapters in, in Genesis. 50. And. <laughs> And in all of that, um, there's there's no more worldwide floods. There's no huge plagues that wipe out nations. There isn't much. I, the, the world is fighting wars all around, but only one of them actually intrudes on Abraham's life. And very minimally. <laughs> yeah. We, we hardly get anything about it. He and just mostly, wins. <laughs> he wins. Yeah. Uh, mostly, he's out there in, in the wilderness raising cows and sheep and selling them and making friends of other sheiks who are doing the same thing and managing a rather large sheikdom of what may have been, um, well, he had 318 homeborn slaves plus other servants, and they all had families. So we're talking a few thousand people at least. Um, and that was his, that was his life. Run, the, run this huge business get along with your competitors, trade with them, and stay away from those wicked cities that want to do wicked things to you, for you, and with you, and and teach your family and in your extended household how to worship God. Because you now have a promise. Somehow God came to him and said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make of you a great nation. Um, you're going to be a blessing to the world. In fact, in you will all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, Abram knew enough to understand that this ties into the promise that God made to Eve at the Garden Gate, that there's someone coming who's going to bless the world. He's going to be not just the seed of Eve, he's going to be the seed of Abraham. And that's the rest of the book. And then we then we begin to start speeding things up as we go through the rest of the books of, of the Bible. Um, but we need to stop and we need to look at this, because what God does with Abram, it's not the kind of thing that we would put in a textbook today. <laughs> but God did. God thought this was really, really important. So we need to stop and look at this promise, this covenant, and what meaning it has for us today. But that, now is going to have to wait till next time. <laughs> well, before we sign off, shall we recommend some cool stuff? We've been doing pretty good with that. I've got to go back and recommend um, the Agatha Christie novel, Death Comes as mm -hmm. an End. It's set in ancient Egypt. It's historically very accurate. And it concerns this whole thing of the deification of an ancestor and why it's important to be the firstborn son who gets to go on feeding great granddad and keeping him happy. And what happens if no one takes on that role? And what happens if the son dies? Who takes his role and who gets the inheritance? So he can, it becomes a murder mystery in Agatha, in Agatha Christie fashion. But as you read, you're not sure where she's going because it seems like the world is full of evil spirits. Are these evil spirits? Are these human beings that are just very sinful? Read it and find out. <laughs> Death comes as an end. All right, I think I'm going to recommend the children's book, Waiting for Gregory. It's very cute. It's about a little girl named Iris who has a cousin coming, and she wants to know when. And the grown-ups cannot give her a satisfactory answer. They tell her things like, oh, not too soon, not too long. <laughs> and then she's drawing diagrams to try and figure out what on earth they mean. <laughs> and the art's very <laughs> lovely, and it's a very sweet little story. And for me, I was going to recommend a book, but 
we didn't get to that part of the discussion that relates to the book. So I will save that for next week. And I will instead uh, jump off from what Emily did last time with her favorite kitchen appliance and recommend my new favorite, uh, which I got as a wedding gift because my husband, David, said we should register for this when I said, why would we want this? And that is an air fryer. So it is a wonderful tool um, that I have started using since we got married instead of uh, doing oven roasting for vegetables and things like that. And it allows you to use less of your oil and still get the wonderful crunchy fried uh, texture on the outside. <laughs> I feel like the air fryer, less mess. <laughs> I've heard more people convinced against their will about the air fryer <laughs> than about any other appliance. <laughs> it just seems so not necessary. And then once you use it, it becomes this, oh, wow, it can do everything. <laughs> So, well, uh, and it's it's fast and it doesn't leave an oily mess. And whereas I don't mind oily messes, my family often does. <laughs> yes, so I my, hate my, oily messes, so. Yeah, my, my wife got a new one and uh, made some salmon for me for the first time. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. So they, they do the job. They're very nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just find a place to store it. Yes, yeah, so the one of the appliances that we can say, thank you, Lord, for technology. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it gave us this. Great. Well... Thank you both so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Uh, thank you to our financial supporters for keeping the show rolling. We really appreciate you. We really value the editing software that you purchased for us. <laughs> um, thank you also to Maggie Smith, who did our cover art. And thank you to... Well, not thank you, but just informing you listeners that we are a production of Diecast Media Group. And thank you listeners so much for listening. We hope you'll join us again next week.